Hi everyone, this is Ezekiel O'Callaghan with Raptor Chatter here to talk about what happened for paleontology in March 2020. The end Cretaceous of North America is fairly well understood, and a lot of this comes from formations like the Hell Creek Formation, which contains many of the fossils that we find from the very end Cretaceous, just before the KPG extinction. However, there are still other formations in North America that can provide new treasure troves of information. Dineo Bellator Noto Hesperus is a new species of dromaeosaurid coming from the southern region of North America, specifically New Mexico. Dineo Bellator helps to show just how diverse the dromaeosaurs were in North America during the end Cretaceous, especially because the other dromaeosaurs we have from this time period, such as Dakota Raptor, are more closely related to animals like dromaeosaurus. Meanwhile, Dineo Bellator is more closely related to the Velociraptorines, meaning that there were at least two very distinctive lineages evolving and still diversifying near the end Cretaceous of North America, and that they likely weren't going to just go extinct naturally over time. Early animals can be split into many groups depending on just their symmetries, specifically animals like the Snyderians, like corals, which show a radial symmetry, as opposed to animals that show a bilateral symmetry, which is most of the animals around today. Now, there are a few unique cases in the fossil record, such as with Dickinsonia, which doesn't show either of these types of symmetry, but instead a glide symmetry, where each of the segments is just slightly offset from one another. But there is a new contemporary of Dickinsonia that does show the earliest known bilateral symmetry. Ikaria wariutia is the oldest known bilateral animal, and seems to resemble some kind of annelid worm, or another type of worm. We can't be totally sure that it's an annelid. However, it does show that the bilateral animals were living before the Cambrian explosion, and the Cambrian explosion did have a lot more animal material and animals around to help evolve and develop into these many broad and diverse groups that we see today. So it might have taken place over a much longer time than has previously been suspected. While Ediacaran fossils still aren't wildly common, things like Ikaria and Dickinsonia do help to show that there was a broad diversity of life before the Cambrian explosion, and that it may have taken place over a longer time period than previously thought, even though it was still very significant. Hands may seem like a fairly simple evolutionary step, and I don't necessarily mean hands like human hands, mainly just the front limbs that many animals use to support themselves today. While in modern fish there's not a real analog to the modern hand of vertebrates that are on land today, in the fossil record we can find these kinds of analogs and one coming from a particular tetrapod or stem tetrapod. A new fossil of the already known Elpistostegi had a very well-preserved section of the fin, and what it shows is that many of the bones were already pretty much in the same place that they are in modern tetrapods on land today. What this means is that essentially the wrist bones and the hand bones were already in their modern shape and positioning. What this kind of similarity means is that either these animals may have been starting to take their first tentative steps on land even earlier than we had thought they were, or that these kinds of bone structures in the hands of modern animals may have evolved for a different purpose, something more suited to the water, though that will need to be determined by further study rather than just a straight bone study that says yes they are in the same places. So a new study did claim to have the smallest dinosaur ever found coming from Burmese amber. And there's a few controversial statements in this paper. The first is that a lot of people are thinking that this may not be a dinosaur, and even the authors have taken this criticism fairly seriously and have considered pulling the paper entirely from nature. The main argument for it not being a dinosaur or a bird, like the authors suggest, is very specific features, such as palate teeth, which aren't found in the dinosaurs, but are very regularly found in different species of reptiles, including the lizards and the rhynchocephalians. While the skull shape does suggest that it could be a bird, it could also just be a case of convergent evolution, with this lizard, if it is indeed a lizard, having taken the same kind of skull shape for very similar reasons, in order to help capture smaller prey of insects and things like that. The other controversial thing about this paper is far less constructive and far less positive, and that's that the labor that is used to mine this type of amber is essentially used using slave labor. A large portion of the profits that comes out of these mines goes to the Myanmar army, and is used to help fund their campaigns of what is essentially genocide against religious minorities in the country, such as the Rohingya people of northern Myanmar. We need to help bring attention to this kind of humanitarian crisis, 
especially since it does tie so closely to paleontology and many of the best fossils that we found over the last decade. By helping to bring attention to it, as we have the position to do, we can hopefully help save lives and bring a more consistent peace to the region. Chickens belong to the galliforms, and in a broader clade than that, the Gaioanceri, which also includes the ducks. What we have found most recently, coming from the Netherlands, is one of these early Gaioanserans, and probably more closely related to the ducks than to the chickens. However, it does show a strange hodgepodge of features that can be associated with both groups. In a very well-preserved skull, coming from marine sediments, the fossil shows a very much fused section of the back of the skull, which is very commonly seen in many types of duck. However, it also shows less connected and more differentiated parts of the front of the skull, a feature more commonly found in chickens. Once again, this animal is probably more closely related to ducks than chickens, but it can help show how they were able to survive the KPG extinction, as this animal did live just before that, coming from very late Cretaceous sediments of the Netherlands. This new species, Asterornis mestrichtiensis, probably shows just how they were able to survive, by being small feeders on the ground, rather than flying around and taking more specialized types of prey. It's very likely that this animal lived much like many modern-day shorebirds do, walking along the shoreline and hunting for small invertebrates, whether they be oysters like some oyster catchers do today, or even just crabs and other small animals. This kind of ground-dwelling behavior probably helped them survive the KPG extinction, being able to find more generalized prey on the ground as opposed to animals like the Eantothornines, a different clade of birds which went extinct at the end of the Cretaceous. This other clade was more suited to flying and taking more specialized types of prey, so when the meteor did hit and caused the mass extinction of many of these small prey forms, they would have been less adapted to catching things because they were so specialized. Meanwhile, animals like Asterornis and other chicken relatives were better suited for catching more generalized prey and thus able to survive. There was also another early chicken relative found, although I don't have a name for this one because it's only known from one bone. We can't be very specific about what exactly it was. This one would be more closely related to the chickens, although it still wouldn't be an ancestor, and comes from the Middle Eocene of Utah. The clade it did belong to, though, had a very wide distribution. While this Utah specimen is known from one bone, that one bone can link it to different species that have been found in Uzbekistan and Namibia, meaning that this clade was very widespread across many continents. What this widespread distribution means is probably one of two things. Either one, their diet being so broad helped them become successful, or two, they were actually able to fly relatively well, which isn't something we think about when we think of modern chickens. Lujibang jiji is a new species and genus of Istiodactylid pterosaur, and it's one of the most unique members of this clade. Most of the Istiodactylid pterosaurs are known for being ocean-going flyers and probably catching prey off the surface of the ocean. They had long teeth towards the front of their mouths to be able to help with this, However, the rest of their mouths were on teeth. That's what makes Luchibang so unique though. While it still had these teeth, it also had long legs, which means it probably didn't spend that much time flying across oceans. Rather, it was more like a wader probably, and something like a heron. These teeth would have still helped it to catch fish in the ocean, but it shows a very unique behavior in the Istiodactylid pterosaurs, and that these clades could be far more broad than we had thought they might be. There were also other new pterosaur finds this month, though nothing specific enough to say that it is a new species, although it may be. In fact, there may be two new species. The Solmhofen limestone is known for being one of the best places to find preserved pterosaurs, with animals like Pterodactylus, the first known pterosaur, coming from the formation. Most of these pterosaurs are relatively small, with none of the pterosaurs coming from this formation having a wingspan of over two meters. However, there have now been described isolated wings, which would have come from an animal with a wingspan over that size. These new wing bones from the formation help to show that some of the larger clades of pterosaurs that took a much more dominant role in many ecosystems during the Cretaceous may have already had their start during the late Jurassic. Now, we can identify that these fossils aren't from any of the major, major clades, such as the Asdarchids or even Ornithocerids. However, it does seem likely that they came from things like the Stenochasmids, or the Sungopterids. These are only known from two wings, with one belonging to each of these clades, meaning that they are at least different species. 
While we will need more specimens in order to properly identify what animals these wings did belong to, there are still a lot of fossils coming out of the Solnhofen limestone every year, so there is a good chance we'll find something to help us understand them better. Extinctions are studied in great detail, with the Permian-Triassic mass extinction being studied on a centimeter by centimeter basis, with documentation of every fossil found in every centimeter for one of the main localities for its study coming from China. But this extinction didn't just take place in the marine sediments like those that are studied in China. The Karoo Basin in South Africa is one of the most notable places for researching this extinction on land. One of the most important ways to see when the transition from Permian to Triassic occurs in the Karoo Basin is by looking at different death assemblages of the animals that were living there at the time, particularly the Lystrosaurus death assemblage, which took place at the beginning of the Triassic. New research and new dating has found that this assemblage took place slightly earlier than the main death and extinction pulse that happened in the Chinese layers, which is where most of this extinction is based around. While it isn't a super major change, with both of these extinctions still happening around 252 million years ago, it does seem like in the Karoo Basin, the main extinction pulse happened about 300,000 years earlier than what happened in China. And this coincides with the main and first pulse of the Siberian traps erupting. These eruptions would have led to a much hotter and drier environment, and this would have let Lystrosaurus, which was much more of a generalist than many of the other animals in the environment, succeed and live through the extinction. It also shows, though, that life on land may not be as resistant to extinction as we might have thought. And that's important, as a lot of the things that led to the Permian mass extinction do have a lot of very similar things occurring today, with things like greater amounts of mercury in the ocean and climate change leading to a much warmer environment. The Pleistocene Ice Ages occurred with a fair amount of regularity, with very regular warming and cooling periods, up until the Younger Dryas period, where a sudden cold snap occurred and caused a lot of the changes that we see into the environments we have today. This occurred about 12,000 years ago, and the exact reason isn't understood with there being many hypotheses, mostly volcanic activity, although some people have also suggested that it may have been an impact from space. The problem with the impact from space is we don't really have any craters from this time period that would be large enough to suggest that an impact did cause this. However, there is some evidence coming from Syria that suggests it may have been some sort of a cosmic event, with an impact not being entirely ruled out. What the researchers found is tektites, and what this is is essentially volcanic glass, or potentially not volcanic glass if it is an impact, which is launched into the sky very, very high, and while it's still melted, cools and hardens into drops that can be somewhat like raindrops, as they are very much aerodynamic because of falling through the air. Many of these Syrian tektites are enriched with things like platinum, which is very rare to find in the Earth's crust, but is very commonly found in meteorites. Additionally, there's not any very nearby volcanic activity, so it does seem much more likely that these tektites formed from some sort of impact from space, or at least an explosion of a meteorite in the atmosphere. Additionally, the temperatures that these tektites likely reached is upwards of 2000 degrees Celsius, which isn't something found on the surface of Earth from volcanoes anymore. So it very much likely was some sort of space-bound object that came into the atmosphere, like a meteorite. Now, this is not by any means definitive evidence in favor of an impact hypothesis for the Younger Dryas period occurring. Rather, it's just another piece of evidence that it may have been. Until we have a more consistent idea of just how much space material was coming into the atmosphere at that time, it's going to be hard to define. And that could come in many forms, such as craters, but also things like the platinum enrichment and also the tektites that were found in Syria. Discussion on whether or not dinosaurs migrated has been had for a long time, and especially with the discovery of many polar types of dinosaurs, it's been suggested that the dinosaurs would have migrated away from these polar regions during the winters in order to find warmer climates. A new study has suggested that this isn't the case, and that's because of strontium isotopes within the teeth. Strontium, when in the body, will replace calcium in the teeth, and so it can be preserved for a very long time, as it does have a very long half-life. Strontium in the Earth's crust also varies very greatly, with adjacent river basins potentially having entirely different amounts of strontium within them. Because of this, if we see dinosaur teeth in the fossil record, we should be able to analyze how much strontium is still preserved within them, 
and be able to get an idea of just how widely an animal varied based on differences within different teeth and when they formed and what water the animal was drinking out of. However, what this research finds is that strontium levels are actually fairly regular among teeth of many different kinds of hadrosaur, meaning that they would have been generally within the same environment. And while yes, they may have potentially migrated a few dozen miles, that's nothing out of the ordinary for animals like elephants, which don't go on very large migrations very often, and still have a very wide natural habitat and territory in which they'll live. This also makes sense because these animals are very much comparable in size to elephants, if not only slightly larger, meaning that this kind of territory size should be expected so that they can find enough food to survive and be able to be a successful species going into the Cretaceous up until their extinction because of a giant rock from space. Hi everyone, thanks for watching. It's been one heck of a thing. I mentioned coronavirus last time in my last video and it's getting worse, so it's weird going to class for uh, field methods when you can't even go out in the field. I do want to mention we have a website and a store now on Redbubble, those should be linked down below. Follow me on Twitter at raptor underscore chatter. Wash your hands, be safe, take care, and don't go extinct.